All right, as we, uh, as we said earlier on, we're going to continue with my message that I started last week, part two of Are We Truly Born Again? And I hope in last week's message, uh, Attached Hearts, I hope that we, um, we've gone and revalued our position with God. Because the sad fact is this, that, and whether you believe it or not, that's how it is. If you do not know Jesus Christ, there's no eternal life. And I know many of us can turn around and say that, what is eternal life? Why should I bother about that now? Because I'm living this life. But I want to warn you that there is life beyond the grave. And there's only two options. There's only two options. According to the word of God, there's only two options. You're either going to be with Jesus forever, eternally, or eternity, for eternity. Or you're going to be in the, in the lake of fire in hell with the devil. Now that's a scary thing because it's not, it's not a, a question of it's going to be a week, it's going to be a month, it's going to be six months and it's over. That's it, for eternity we will be there. Now that's a scary part of it. And I know as I'm standing here this morning there are people that says, Pastor, that is mumbo jumbo. You're entitled to believe what you want to believe. But it's my job to make sure that I bring the truth to you. That you can never ever turn around one day and say, I did not know. I was not warned. That's my job. I want you to turn in your Bible with me to 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. Just one passage of scripture. I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture this morning. Uh, just to continue with the message. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, let's read from verse five, uh, 3. And I'm going to read from the uh, King James expository version. Are we there? Can I, can I start? Right, verse 3. It says, but if your gospel be hid, explanation... Christ and him crucified. If that is hidden to you, it is hid to them who are lost. It's hidden to those people that are lost. Lost because they will not accept the message of the cross. Verse 4, For in whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of them which believe. Not a willful blindness, Lest the height of the glorious gospel of Christ, the, mes the message of the cross, who is the image of God, who alone is the image of God, Christ alone and him crucified is the image of God, should shine unto them. If men reject the cross, they have in effect rejected Jesus Christ. Now I've shared in, on many occasions that what the cross is all about, why Jesus was crucified, and that's the thing that we need to understand, what it's all about. The unconverted person faces a hopeless situation, a hopeless situation given the force arrayed against him. All the forces of darkness, all the demons in hell that has been lined up and arrayed against us, that is what our battle is against. Although he may be acquainted with religious philosophies and theologies, he is blinded. Many people, and I'm sure sitting here today, there are many people that once in their life were involved with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Once sat under the teaching of some uh, Christian school or some, some uh, the, uh, religious denomination. Somewhere, somebody sat there, but they didn't fully understand what it was all about. 
Some, on the other hand, understood what it was all about. They've got all the theology. They've, all, they've got all the knowledge in their head. But they are blinded to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The truth of the cross. The truth of why Jesus came. They're blinded to the message of the gospel. A key passage on conversion is found in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I just want to go there and minister on this a little while. John chapter 3. It's the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus. From verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Said to have been one of the three richest men in Jerusalem. Listen to this. One of the three richest men in Jerusalem. A ruler of the Jews. A member of the Sanhedrin. The ruling body of Israel. The same came to Jesus by night. It says that it is not known exactly as to why he came by night. But I can surmise, I can think in my own mind, being a member of the Sanhedrin and the ruling party, he didn't want to be seen with Jesus in the day. So he came by night. At least he came. That is my perception of it. And said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher, come from God. The pronoun we could indicate that Nicodemus represented several members of the Sanhedrin. Several members, of, they must have caucused, they must have spoken uh, uh, among themselves, who is this man Jesus? What is he bringing to us? We need to go to him. Or a truth could have dropped into their hearts and said, we need to get close to this man. We need to get, to get close to him. And my message this morning is, we need to get close to him. We need to get close to him. Nicodemus addressed Christ here as a man and not as God. The cross would change him. Only at the cross he would be changed. Jesus Christ. He came to him as a man. For no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. In this he is absolutely correct. No man can perform the miracles that Jesus Christ performed unless God was with him. We read in the Bible of many others that performed miracles by another source, from another force. But not from Jesus. And not the way that Jesus could do it. A key passage on conversion is found in John chapter 3 as I said. Nicodemus, a esteemed religious leader, was told by Jesus, No one, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, interesting, in verse 3 it says, Jesus answered and said to him, presents an answer totally different from that which he expected. Verily, verily, I say unto you, most assuredly, that's what that word means, most assuredly, be sure that I'm saying to you, except the man be born again. The term born again means that man has already had a natural birth, but now must have a spiritual birth, which comes by faith in Christ in what he has done for us at the cross and is available to all. He cannot see the kingdom of God, it says. Actually means that without the new birth, one cannot, excuse me, understand or comprehend the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him in verse, in verse 4, how can a man be born when he's old? Many of you have heard this story before. It's been preached many times. I mean, it's just common sense. I remember when I got saved and I read this passage of scripture, I thought to myself the same thing exactly what Nicodemus is thinking. How can a man be born again? How can you enter your mother's womb again if you're a grown man? How can that happen? I mean, that's a natural thing that we think about because we think in the natural. We're thinking in the natural instead of thinking in the spiritual, in the spiritual realm. Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? It seems he did not know the language of the prophets concerning circumcision of the heart, Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 and Jeremiah 4 verse 4. It speaks about, there the prophets already spoke about 
the circumcision of the heart. You've got to be cut in the heart. Your heart has got to change. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. The phrase born of water speaks of the natural birth, which Jesus says in the next verse, and pertains to a baby being born. Being born of the Spirit speaks of spiritual birth, which is brought about by God alone. And neither does it speak of water baptism. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the Spirit, verse 6, born of the flesh, sorry, is flesh has to do with the natural birth and is illustrated as stated by the phrase, born of water. And that which is born of the Spirit, the Spirit, has to do with that which is solely of God. The one flesh has no relationship with the other spiritual and cannot be joined. It cannot be joined together. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear the sound, but it cannot tell where it comes from. So it is exactly with everyone born of the Spirit. John chapter 3 verse 8. It says there, the wind blows where it wants to, but nobody knows where it comes from. We cannot determine where the wind comes from, especially here where we live. I mean, we can have the wind in four different directions in, in a question of half an hour. I mean, then it comes from the south, and the next thing it comes from the north, and the next thing it's from the west, west and the east, and we don't know what's happening. That's the, how the wind works. It's exactly how the Spirit works. We cannot determine how the Spirit works. Only God knows. Only God knows. And for many years, we've all in the church tried to bring a little story, say a little prayer, or do something to help the Spirit of God along. He doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help. The only thing he needs from us is obedience. That's all he needs. So it is where everyone is born of the Spirit, John chapter 3 verse 8. Nicodemus practiced his religion very carefully and with great rewards from his peers. He did everything he thought was required. However, he could not by his own will or volition cause himself to be born again. He could not give birth to himself. There's no man that can give birth to himself. It's impossible. It can't happen. Only God, only God the parent gives the new birth. Only God can do it. Nobody else. After the Holy Spirit of God has convicted us of our sin and revealed Jesus to us as the one who saves us from our sin and a terrible penalty, we must come to Jesus by cleansing from sin. The minute that the Holy Spirit brings conviction in our heart and the revelation comes that I'm a sinner, I need a savior. I need to be saved from the sinful life. When that happens, the born again experience happens. And we're going to talk a little bit further about the question is, how does it happen? How does it happen? After the Holy Spirit of God has convicted us of our sin and revealed Jesus to us as the one who saves us from our sin and its terrible penalty, we must come to Jesus for cleansing from sin. We must come to Jesus exclusively and trust in him for salvation. For salvation. You know what the Spirit of God just revealed to me? There are people here that's not even here. There are people here that's bodily here, but their mind is not here. Heed the warning from God. This might be your very last chance. It might be your very last chance to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It might be the very last chance that Jesus is coming to you and saying to you, here I am. Here I am. I can change your life. Please, gentlemen, I cannot, and ladies, I cannot, there is no words for me to express the fear that's in my heart. The fear that's in my heart for people that are lost, that are going to hell by the thousands, every minute of the day, every minute of the day, people are going to hell. The world that we're living in today has got no conception or perception of what's happening. 
The world is on a roller coaster. We're on the brink of one of the greatest wars that the world has ever seen. Mark my words, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. If we, read, if we read the word of God, if we read the prophets, and we read what's been prophesied, we can see on the times that we're in what's going to happen. And I, I'm really, I'm pleading with you guys. I'm pleading with those by camera, by television. Please don't continue living that lifestyle. Change your heart. Change your heart. You might be in a place this morning where despair is all over you. Everything is going wrong in your life. Things are happening and it's not suiting you the way things are happening. Jesus has got a plan. God's got a plan for your life. Take it now. Take it now. Don't let it pass by. Take it now. I can't, I can't emphasize it enough how serious it is. Jesus is the only one that can work salvation and forgiveness in our life. We must come to the risen Savior who shed his blood for us while he was on the cross and cast ourselves upon God's mercy. We are here because of God's mercy today. Many of us can identify with the fact that we should have been dead. The things that we did, the things we got involved in should have killed us or could have killed us. And it's God's mercy. God's mercy, God's mercy on our life. I know about that. Twice in my life I experienced that where I was at the brink, at the brink of death. Death was staring me in the eye and God's mercy came. Because I clung to him. I said, Jesus, I need you. Pull me through this thing. When the doctor turns around and he said to you, there's no hope, there's no hope, there's no hope anymore. There's nothing we can do for you. When you get to that place and you're staring it in the eye, And you don't know Jesus Christ, you've got serious trouble on your hands. I promise you. Serious, serious trouble on your hands. We must come to a risen Savior who shed his blood on the cross for us. Out of our Father's great love for us, he sent forth his unique, his unique eternal son. Unique, he was a unique person. There has never ever been a person like that on this earth again. One man that impacted the world forever. One man impacted the world forever. And so easily we can go about our daily things, our daily chores, our daily living and forgetting about Jesus Christ. So easy we can fall into the trap of lying. So easily when we're confronted and we say, what happened there? We tell a little lie. So easy. And it becomes habit. And it, and it, and it creates a foothold in your life, which eventually becomes a stronghold. And we can't shake loose from it. Substances. Substance dependence. <coughs> Is a Mickey Mouse thing for God. It's a Mickey Mouse thing for God. If your heart, if you're, you've been cutting your heart, and you know that Jesus Christ is the Savior that can save you out of this thing, and you're fully convinced in your heart, by faith you believe, it's done. It's done. God the Father sent his son to die on the cross 
in accordance with the prophecies of scripture. It's prophesied. We can read it in the prophecies. And he placed on him all the sin of the world because he was the perfect sacrifice. The spotless lamb. The perfect sacrifice. How does the unconverted person come to Jesus? That's the question. I've got a hesitation in my heart. Because I don't want to try and get you to understand that there's a specific method. There's no specific method. There's no specific method for conversion. However, since Jesus is the living, resurrected Lord, we can have a relationship with him. We can come to him. We can come to him. And this is what being born again is all about. Having a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. On a, not a daily, not a monthly, not when you feel like it, minute by minute of the day. Minute by minute, we should have a relationship with him. And we all fail. We all fail in that area. All of us. We make decisions, quick decisions, without consulting the Lord. We say things without consulting the Lord. Things come out of our mouth that's not from God. I was sharing with Pastor Ina last night, you know what, this last year has been a terrible year for me. I've been going through the mincer with the Lord. The Lord has really been mincing me, changing my theology, my way of thinking. Things that I learned that, I, that I've been ministering for over 20 years, changing that, coming to the realization, what is the truth? The truth. And we've got, a, we, we got, a, uh, we've got this burden. God wants us to preach the truth to people. Not bless me club. Make you feel better. And I'm not saying this this morning. And it, it might come across that I'm angry. I'm not angry. I'm passionate. I'm passionate about seeing people being saved. I'm passionate about people being healed and delivered. From this terrible Terrible scourge that's destroying a nation, that's destroying the young people of the world. Substances. Substances. And we so willfully run to it and we offer our lives up. Take it. We even pay people to kill us by running to dealers and buying substances from them. I want to say to people by camera, there's hope. There's hope if you've got a child or you've got a husband or you've got a, a wife or a, or a family member that's on substances. There's hope. Christ can set them free. So I hesitate to bring a method of conversion. However, since Jesus is the living and resurrected Lord, we can have a relationship with him. We come to Jesus in prayer, confessing and repenting of our sin. We come to Jesus for his mercy. His mercy. We come to Jesus to have our sin covered by his shed blood. Amazing. Amazing. There's only one method in the whole of this universe that can wash your sins away. There's only one way for it to be done. That's through the blood of Jesus Christ. We talk to Jesus. We ask Jesus to save us. We, we may come to Jesus through prayer. Not a special prayer. Listen nicely. Not a special prayer. Not a particular form of words that could even be written down or memorized. Just pray. That's all. Just pray. 
I've come to the realization after my studies over the last couple of months that we can do nothing except preach the gospel. Share the word of Jesus Christ. Share the gospel. Share the words of the Bible with people. And the Holy Spirit must do the work. The Holy Spirit must cut us in the heart. Jesus died in our place. He shed the blood to cleanse us of all sin. His royal blood he shed for us. However awful it might sound. I mean, if we, if we study the crucifixion, it was terrible. He suffered in agony and pain for us. But through that came the deliverance of sin. The healing in people's lives. Emotional, physical healing that we need so badly. As Simon was ministering to this morning in song, I thought to myself, so many, so many of us can identify with what he's saying about. So many of us came out of a lifestyle of hurt and pain. So many of us grew up not even being understood. And the pain that we carried with it. And many of us go around blaming somebody else. The word of God is very clear on it. We shouldn't go around blaming other people. Faith, biblical faith, which is trust in Jesus alone, is not derived from any work that we do. No works. There's nothing, there's no works that we can do to be born again. There's no works that we can do to be saved. There's nothing we can do except faith and trust in Jesus. Faith is trusting and relying exclusively on Jesus. And what he did on the cross, no baptism, no communion, not any work we do can get us into the kingdom. Those are things that take place in the natural order after getting saved. When we were away now, we were speaking, me and Pastina. Speaking about baptism. You know, when I got saved, and I truly believe, at that point in time, the Holy Spirit spoke in my heart, and the Holy Spirit drew me to Jesus. And I got saved through Jesus. I knew in my heart after that. Nobody told me. It was a natural thing that came in my heart. You've got to be baptized. So that follows conversion. Baptism follows conversion. You don't get baptized first and conversion follows. No, conversion first and then baptism. Some people... When you ask them, how do you know I'm sa you're saved? Oh, I'm, I'm part of this denomination. But how do you know that you're saved? Oh, I'm baptized. I was baptized. But how do you know that you were saved? Oh, I partake of the communion. But how do you know that you're, bapt uh, that you're saved? Oh, I work in this department and I work in that department in the church. I'm, I'm working for the Lord. That means nothing. Absolutely nothing. That is the problem today. Many people believe that they're born again. And they're not. Sad to say. We've got to do introspection. We've got to look at our lives and see, are we truly born again? Is there an ongoing process in my life that the Lord is changing me? 
I'm speaking from experience. For a long time in my life, I got saved many years ago. And I can see the pattern. You get saved and you become complacent. Eventually, after five years, after 10 years, you become complacent. You're saved. And we don't allow the Lord to work in our life on a daily basis to take away those dirty, filthy habits. Saying the wrong things, speaking out of turn, all this type of stuff. Many, many things that I can name up this morning that he spoke to me about. Change it. Change it. Change it. Stop it. I will help you, but you must make an effort to stop it. Saving faith is impossible without the enabling work of the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 13 verse 48. I just want to read that quickly. Acts chapter 13 verse Acts chapter 13 verse 48 and when the Gentiles heard this they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord they knew this meant they knew this, this meant them and it brought to what it meant to them and this brought great joy even as it should and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. 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 We've got to believe. By faith, we've got to believe. And I, and I, I really, I want, to, I want to say this from my heart. I hope this morning as I'm ministering here that the Holy Spirit brings conviction in all our hearts. Because Jesus said, I go away, but I sent the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth that will convict the world of sin. That will convict the world of sin. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. To believe in Jesus is to come to him for salvation. Faith is not an idea, a notion, a wish, a hope. A doctrine or theology. Biblical faith is trusting that Jesus can and will save us. That's a big thing. That's a big thing. Jesus declared. All that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. That's what Jesus said. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. He who comes to Jesus is giving to Jesus by the Father. First, there is God's work. In our life. There is God's work in our life. And then. By the enabling of the Holy Spirit. The person trusts in Jesus for salvation. We've got to get that part right gentlemen. That's why so many people. They. On the roundabout. Or on the, on the, on the carousel. So many times. Because we don't understand. What it means. To be born again. How many times haven't we made an altar call, a raising of hands, people come forward and we pray for them and we believe in our heart that they're saved? And I want to say this, there are those that do get saved like that. There are those that do get saved. But the bulk of the people, in a week, in a month, in six months' time, He's back to his old ways. As I said in the first teaching last week, unless there is fruit, good fruit, how shall we know them? By the fruit that they bear. 
It is clear no one initiates a move towards God out of his own. It's very clear. Man, in his sinful nature, does not out of his own come to God. The word of God says that. I don't say that. No mechanism is given as to how a person comes to Jesus. Instead, as I spoke about in my first message, that gap, that creation uh, uh, painting of Michelangelo where God's hand points to man's hand and they don't touch. That gap in between, that's the part that where it happens and we don't understand it. We call it the mystery. It's a mystery. A mystery that takes place. The mystery is what God alone knows. Only God knows it. And no one knows how a person comes to Jesus. Nobody. I can try and describe it when I got saved. I can try... There was a touching in my heart that propelled me out of my seat. I knew as I was sitting in that seat, you are lost. You're a lost sinner. You're going to go to hell. That's what I knew. That night when I sat in that church and the pastor was preaching, I can't tell you what he preached on. I don't know the sermon. I can't remember what, what it was all about. But I know one thing that he spoke in my heart. Not the pastor, the Holy Spirit. Spoke in my heart and I knew that I need to get to know this man Jesus. Otherwise, I would end up in hell. When a person does come to Jesus, however, he is converted and freely receives forgiveness of sin and life everlasting. Has the mystery of conversion been explained? Absolutely not. The Bible does not clear up the mystery of conversion. Over the years, if we study the Bible over years, we will see that there is no lay down message concerning how a person gets converted. There's, those are mysteries that God holds in his hand that we do not understand now. That he doesn't want to reveal to us now. Because if we knew how it came about, we would try and tweak it. We would try and work on it. We would try and change the method. We would try and add to the method. We would try and take away from the method. To get it to seeker friendly. That we, it suits us. It suits us. Salvation belongs to God. And it's his work that he does. Yes, a person comes to Jesus and he's wonderfully, mysteriously converted. It happens. I don't know if you in this congregation and those maybe by television have heard this story before. You meet a person and the person says, you know what? I found Jesus. Let me tell you something. Jesus has never been lost. He's never been lost. We don't have to find him. Through God, he finds us. And they say, I found Jesus. I've changed my life. And we sit and we wait. And later on, you see that person doing exactly what he did before. And you think to yourself, what a fraud. If that is all about Jesus, I don't want to be part of it. And there are things that happen in the church. There are things that happen in Christianity where one hurts the other. People get hurt. I know I've been through it. Not only me getting hurt, but me doing the same thing as other people. And I want to be honest this morning. And then there are the others that get saved. And they, the Spirit of God touches their life and there's a change in their life. And we see fruit and they continue 
year after year, continue, continue, continue. What does the word of God say? He who perseveres to the end shall receive the prize. Paul writes about running the race. Paul writes about that, running the race. Completing the race. Continuing and not giving up. Serving Jesus is hard. It's hard. But it's also easy. It's a paradox. It's so difficult some days. But when the answer comes, it's so glorious, it's so easy. Difficult on the one side, easy on the other side. Take my yoke, my yoke is light and easy. Some people are converted and they never pray a prayer at all. The Holy Spirit just draws them to God. They don't pray, they just say, here I am, take me Lord. Here I am, I know I'm a sinner. Maybe that's a form of prayer. I don't know. But it's not a ritual prayer. It's not a written prayer. It's not a thing that is conversed sentence by sentence over and over again. There's no chanting. One person who recognized his lost condition and was seeking salvation was converted when he read about the substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross. One person, they just read about it. Many people are, are saved by accepting a tract on a street. Some accept a tract and they look at it and they fold it up and they put it in their wallet. And years down the line, months down the line, they look at that thing and the Lord touches their life and changes them. It's a mystery. It's a mystery of the ages. But there's nothing more greater than serving Jesus. Another person having been merely Christianized for many years and being entirely miserable was converted instantly. Instantly during a sermon. That was me. Miserable. And once changed. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you Lord for your grace. A little bit of history during the first awakening in America between 1735 and 1745, tens of thousands of people were converted without responding to any appeal to come forward or praying a formal prayer at all. Tens of thousands. John Wesley. We look at John Wesley. A man that rode hundreds of thousands of kilometers on horseback on horseback to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. A man that when he died, he owned a minister's cloak, a worn out Bible, six knives and forks. That's all he left behind. Plus the Methodist church. George Whitfield, another great preacher of that time. Gilbert Tennant, and then Jonathan Edwards, one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. And many others that preached at that time. There would be loud groanings and moanings in the congregation. Agonizing during the sermon. Agonizing. Over their sins. People would roll out of their seats. And agonize on the floor. That they are sinners. Men and women would faint out of fear. Of having broken God's law. We so easily do it today. So easily. We just break the laws of God. In the case of Gilbert Tennant, it was common for people to be converted after his preaching. Didn't even happen in the service. Some went home, sitting at dinner, and the power of God hit them. 
Some woke up the next morning and the power of God hit them. Some were in their beds and the power of God hit them. They were converted. Any person who's convicted of sin and sees Jesus as a remedy for his sin can come, can come by the power of the Holy Spirit to Jesus. There's a motivation. There's a force that pushes you. I said to Pastor, I said to Pastor Ina and to many people in my life, I don't know what happened that night when I got saved. I can't, I can't describe it. I was, I, uh, I consciously came into church and I sat right against the wall. Because for weeks the pastor was preaching and conviction came in my heart and I said, I am not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I do not accept this. And I sat against the wall there. And a force came that took me from my seat. And I ran forward and I said, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner, I'm lost. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. You and your household. We read this in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And in closing, I just want to share this scripture. Acts 16, verse uh, 31. Yeah, we see the story of Paul and Silas being imprisoned. In Acts chapter 16, uh, verse 30. Let's read from verse 30. And they brought them, brought Paul and Silas out of the prison and said, Sirs, what must we do to be saved? Yeah, we see the jailer saying, what must we do to be saved? Presents the most beautiful explanation of salvation that could ever be given. And our house means that salvation is not limited merely to the jailer, but is available to the entirety of the family as well. That is, if they will meet the conditions of faith in Christ required of them. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord, pertaining to a fleshing out of answers given in the previous verse, explaining what believing in Christ really meant. And to all that were in his house presents this service being conducted sometime after midnight, which resulted in all of his family giving their hearts to Christ. What a beautiful night it turned out to be. That scripture that says, I, 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 I wrestled with that scripture. I thought to myself, yeah, he says, Paul says, Paul and Silas says, you and your household will be saved. Now, in the natural, a man thinks, well, uh, the jailer is going to get saved and his household automatically. That's, what the, that's how you read it. But that's not what it means. It means you're going to get saved and your household is going to get saved. If they meet the conditions, if they, if they accept and they repent. Luke doesn't tell us what must I do to be saved. Luke doesn't tell us in the book, in, in this scripture. The jailer was baptized, but baptism, you will read later on in verse 33 and, uh, 33 and 34. He was baptized. The jailer was baptized. Baptism follows conversion. It does not produce it. The fact is there is no mechanism. There is no sinner's prayer, no coming forward, no testimony, no work at all. But the mystery of God. The jailer had heard the preaching. The Holy Spirit convinced the jailer and convicted him of his need and revealed Jesus to him as Savior. That's how it happens. That's how it works. And that is how Jesus said it would be. That's what he said how it would be. He told us how it would be. The jailer was converted and we are not told how. He was simply commanded to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Instead of preaching for true conversions, many of us have resorted to gimmicks such as church growth techniques, how to 15 minute sermons and forms of feel good entertainment. To get seekers 
to get seekers into the church. Seeker friendly churches. Tell us what you want to hear and we'll preach it. It's not about filling the house. It's about touching the hearts of people. That's what it's all about. We are just here to preach the message of, of, of the gospel, the gospel message, and the Holy Spirit will do his work. The Holy Spirit will do his work. He'll touch lives. He'll change lives. And I pray this, uh, this morning as we close the service, I pray, and I'm not through with this message yet. We're going to continue part three of it. And then we're gonna, I'm going to share on you why people backslide after this message. We're going to co continue with this message next time. And my prayer this morning is, my, the prayer of my heart is that we will look at our lives. We will look at our lives and we will do introspection and see, am I really changing? On a daily basis. Or is this just. Am I just playing the right tune. That somebody wants to hear. Am I dancing the right steps. Am I conforming. To the program. Just to be in sync with the program. And later on go out. And go and do it again. Is that. What it's all about. No. It's about giving your life to Jesus Christ. It's about being saved. Being born again. It's about living a righteous life. And allowing the Holy Spirit on a daily basis to change us. To change us. To change us. Substances, as I said, is nothing. It's Mickey Mouse to God. God can do it. God wants to do it. Do you want to do it? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we thank you. Thank you for your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll have your way and your will in the lives of people those in this congregation those watching my television father we thank you this morning thank you for your mercy thank you for your grace father we pray the love of god on this congregation and those viewing the grace of the lord jesus christ and the fellowship of the holy spirit until we come together again in jesus name amen amen